welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report. Uh, I'm John Arola. This is a building rapidly filling with more and more people, scary people in a scary time. Why are they coming close to me? I don't know if I can trust it yet. But socially distanced, there's people I trust. You know, one of those people, Benjamin Dixon, who joins us once again on the show. Ben, how's it going? Going great, John. Thanks for having me back. And shout out to the uh, the Dragon Squad for always showing me love over <laughs> on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love hearing that they're. They're going and you know watch it because like, obviously there's a lot of like cross pollination between shows, but that they're, right. you know, that they're a fan of you. They should be because I am too, and I'm very glad to have you here. Um, there's there's a number of people whose perspective I you know always want to have, but especially in these last like 12 days until the election, like I just want to, I just want to bash my brain against some other good brains and see what's going on. Um, what can we expect? What are we worried about? And I think that the rundown that we have for today's show is going to go into a lot of that. So, uh, you know, I know you must be very busy in these couple of weeks. Thank you for making time for the show. Pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, please feel free to hit the like button, share the stream, let people know that we're active. They can come become part of the community uh, in that classic one of us, one of us style. And uh, did you know, by the way, that although I'm wearing one of the classic TYT shirts, the uh, I wrote the damn bill shirt, um, TDR's got its own shirts now. You wanna see one? Take a look at this. The Dragon Squad shirt <laughs> is now live at shoptyt.com, uh, designed by the awesome artist uh, Carlos Godoy. It's a very cool design, a taste of what's to come. Um, but if you uh, want this, you can go to shoptyt.com. We've also got a, a cool spray paint design uh, damage report shirt as well that's been uh, doing very well. Which is awesome because it shows that you know that that, that people want to show their support uh, for the show, but more importantly, because I know that on some level it's bothering Jank Uger, <laughs> and so that makes me feel good. Schadenfreude, it's the best <laughs> pleasure, really. Anyway, <laughs> with that, you ready to do some news, Ben? Hey, let's do it, Ben. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Here's a few more minutes to add on to 60 Minutes, which tried to do what it does, interview the president and Trump wasn't having that. And so yesterday we caught you up with what I thought was going to be all of the drama around what should have just been a conversation between the president and Leslie Stahl and turned into this massive thing that Trump seems to think is gonna benefit him, but I'm not really getting it. Well, there's even more drama now, so let's catch you up on that. This morning, Trump tweeted this. I will soon be giving a first in television history full unedited preview of the vicious attempted takeout interview of me by Leslie Stahl. Watch her constant interruptions and anger. Compare my full flowing and magnificently brilliant answers to their cues. Really fast, is the cues there? Is he trying to make people think about QAnon? Why did he say cues like that? That's exactly what I think. As soon as I saw it, I'm like, okay, he's throwing a signal to QAnon. Obviously, he's he loves that crowd, and and they all are. Honestly, um, there was Steve Bannon was doing whatever show he does on whatever network it is, and he talked about the storm coming. And you had a, a Don Jr. in the last 24 hours talking about Joe Biden being linked to international human trafficking um, and prostitution rings. Obviously, all of this is just they they only have Q basically. They only have, we're gonna try to get the QAnon people fired up. And so that seems like what he's doing. But there's just so much whining in it that she's angry and interrupting. He tweeted, look at the bias, hatred and rudeness on behalf of 60 Minutes and CBS. Tonight's anchor, Kristen Welker, is far worse because this is what an alpha male does. Bitch, 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 bitch all day long. Um, so anyway, uh, we now have, the 60 Minutes interview because he did what he said he was going to do yesterday. It was his pleasure to release it. So they've released it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because you know we're a 60 Minutes program. So, um, but I do want to show you just the very beginning to give you an idea of how it started. We know how it ended with him fleeing the building, running away from Leslie Stahl. Here's the beginning. Are you ready for some tough questions? You're going to be fair. Are you I'm going to be fair. Just be fair. But last time I remember you saying to me, bring it on, bring it on. No, no, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for fairness. That's all. You're going to get fairness. But you're okay with some tough questions. No, I'm not. You're not okay with tough questions. Well, I'm going to be fair. You, you don't ask Biden tough questions. Me? Huh? I don't agree with you. Terrible. That. It's I don't terrible. Agree with you. <laughs> you know that. Okay, are you, you ready? ready? Everybody ready? 
Okay, so um, she says, you know, last time you said bring it on, and now he's like, no, I don't want that. You don't ask Biden tough questions. It. I don't know, Ben. Maybe maybe I'm projecting. Maybe I'm seeing what I want to see. That's very popular in 2020. But he he seems like a shrunken, beaten down version of himself there. Yeah, and I think it really reveals what he actually is, right? He constantly pretends that if he's this tough guy, but when the rubber meets the road, he is a child. He's a petulant man child who's like, you don't do this to Joe Biden. And I'm like, really, are you, you actually said that out loud as if it is something an adult <laughs> human being should say, let alone like people who think and buy into the idea of an alpha male. You actually said that out loud. And that really just shows you, man, he's, he's a child. And in, in, in that mainly that he's been spoiled his whole life and nobody's ever challenged him. Yeah. Yeah, he just he he can't take it. He wants the image of a person who's ready for anything. Bring it on, bro. But in reality, he just he just demands unwavering loyalty and deference and that's it. And he just he bristles like an emotional little child when he doesn't get that. And that's why he fled and that's what caused all of this mess that like I said in the intro, I know that he likes this drama and I know that his base likes the drama. They, they're not interested in an interview between him and Leslie Stahl, but they are interested in a royal rumble between him and Leslie Stahl where they see Trump as being the one to deliver the last you know, um, Hurricane Rana or something. <laughs> um, but does that help you in the election? Does that like, so he, I'm not gonna show you all the tweets from this morning, but he did his other thing. So as you pointed out, he just says the thing that like, dude, don't say you never asked Biden tough questions. Like that's pathetic, but keep it inside. Do what I do, I'm pathetic mostly on the inside. But he also did, he did one other thing that he does, which is he just says the thing he wants to be true as if it was true, giving us way too much access to his psychology. So he tweeted this morning, uh, finally, suburban women are flocking to me. And he also said, this Hunter Biden stuff so bad, even the mainstream media is saying it has to be covered. Neither of those things are happening. You just so desperately want them and you just say it as if it's true. It's like speech by vision board, but that's <laughs> not how reality works. It might make you feel good, but it's not gonna win you the election. It's it's that uh, it's that power of positive thinking that he actually subscribes mm -hmm. to, and, I, and I'm really curious if they really believe this because I, I I mean it doesn't just happen like he's getting he's getting blasted in this interview. It didn't go well for him. Suburban white women are not feeling him this time around. Thank goodness, right? And and the Hunter Biden thing has like backfired spectacularly. Where I've seen people so far to the left of me that they think I'm a neoliberal, I see them having a, a little bit of empathy for Joe Biden now and. And I'm, I'm like, seriously, these all, all these things have backfired on you. How is it a positive thing, Donald Trump? You're right, you're right. You know, really fast aside as an example, maybe of the sort of thing you're talking about where, look, I've started to feel a little bit bad for Joe Biden and his family. Like there was the, was it John Cardillo or whoever that, that guy yes. is, who tweeted the photo of yes. Joe kissing his son. And he's like, is this an appropriate interaction for a father and a son? And like, yes. sure, it created a lot of fun. Yeah, totally. Like, you're, you're a father, correct? Yeah, yes. Three kids. Yeah, okay. And you kiss them occasionally, right? Every day. Seems cool. It seems normal. Totally, to me. To totally human. Totally normal. What kind of what kind of relationship did they have with their parents that that was abnormal? Yeah, I. Yeah, exactly. Like you're. You're either a monster or you're so pathetic, but either way you can't tell. With this slight, there's a there's one there's a third option to this, and that is that 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 John Cardillo thing, it's just the Q stuff again. Right. Hey, look exactly. at him. He's kissing his kid. He likes to kiss kids. And that might be it. I don't know what way it's sick, but I know that it's sick. I can tell that. Um, but anyway, yeah, this interview didn't look good for him. We're gonna talk a little bit later on about the debate, but this just isn't this isn't it, man. This isn't it. I know he's supposed to be a genius. He beat, he beat Hillary Clinton or whatever, but I, I just I don't see how this is the thing that turns it around for him. I just don't. Uh, if he keeps speaking it into existence, I, I think he believes it's going to change. So the positive thinking, he's pushing that. Yeah, yeah. The power of positive thinking. What he needs is the the power of Christ compels you, dude. You got something <laughs> wrong inside of you. You need to force it out. Anyway, can that we? Was good. Thank you. Uh, old school movie reference. Anyway, um, so we've talked about a couple of pathetic things. Uh, let's talk about one more pathetic thing. Um, one of the ways that Donald Trump and his team have attempted to spin his uh, flight from Leslie Stahl is that uh, 
Leslie Stahl in the end, she had to acknowledge how awesome he was. Here's an example of that, Trump tweeted this. Kaylee McEnany presenting Leslie Stahl with some of the many things we've done for healthcare. Leslie had no idea. And that is Kaylee McEnany um, hefting not her normal binder of answers, but uh, supposedly a book filled up with all of what they've done for healthcare. Not their healthcare plan, mind you, you will never, ever, ever see that. But they did get this book. But here's the self own in it. If you zoom into that last photo, this is the latest in a long string of blank pieces of paper. Like you can see that. Like, okay, I understand in books, the first couple pages might be blank. She's a chunk of the way in there. I don't see anything on that page. I just don't. Uh, no, are they serious with this? I'm, I'm trying to see the picture. That really is, that's a really big book, first of all. And they clearly have not accomplished that many things in on healthcare, um, let alone the fact that they have absolutely no plan for us. Um, I, I, has Leslie Stahl uh, confirmed that she said that this was awesome? Or is this just another thing that he's just throwing out and trying to make it true? Because I, I haven't seen her talk at all about it. This is all the way Kaylee and Trump have talked about that interaction. And, and my last thing about this is, have they like officially cleared Kaylee McEnany and all of the White House staff that were infected with COVID-19? Because I don't see a single mask in it. And I'm a little far away from my monitor. Maybe there is a mask and I just can't see it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't see a mask. Um, I assume it's been a bit, um, she seems healthy enough. Trump, I'm sure, has mostly recovered. Although he had an interview, I think, with Fox and Friends a day ago, oh, yeah. or two days ago, where he he didn't sound great. Man. <laughs> I don't know if I sounded like that. I would take I would take a half day. Take a day I off. Think. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, on the paper, uh, it is possible that somewhere in that book is text. Um, it's also possible. That they thought they could get away with this because Donald Trump thinks I would never ever want to open a book. Why would Leslie Stahl? Let's just give her a blank one. Um, and understand that this is not the first time that they've tried to hoodwink people with fake paper and fake writing. Um, when you know his lungs were falling apart, this was a photo that they sent out of him hard at work. Um, Writing in a Sharpie on a blank piece of paper, I guess that was supposed to be impressive. Way back in 2017, he had this tweet writing my inaugural dress at the Winter White House. Um, yeah, people have done photos of that desk in front of that wall. It's just in some random hallway. They just did that as a photo shoot. He's not actually writing a speech. He doesn't write his speech. Stephen Miller writes his speeches. Not to mention the financial disclosure papers, all those binders when he was inaugurated that they wouldn't let reporters actually look at or the fake regulation tower that they made. They have no respect for ink on paper. They like the paper, the ink they wanna leave out of it though. <laughs> You know, but it really just boils down to the fact that he's been able to get away with this type of stuff throughout his entire career, and he thinks that this is something that he can get away with as president. But it really speaks to the fact that he has lived a life so privileged that he has not ever been held accountable. He can bluff, and no one has ever called him on his bluff. But this is a whole yeah. different ball game that he wasn't prepared for. I think so. I think so. Anyway, the whole thing is sad. I haven't. Uh, the the interview has just been released. CBS, I think it is. Um, is saying, you know, they're obviously frustrated with him for releasing it. They're still going to release theirs, and it's going to get so many more views than it would have. And he's obviously not going to look good in it. Great idea, Trump. Amazing strategy there. So we'll see if you know more details come out from it. Um, this is this is what I was able to see so far. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. 
And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. I wasn't expecting a return from Borat. I certainly wasn't expecting Rudy Giuliani to show up in it. Um, he might not have either, but unfortunately for him, he has. And they apparently had this scene that's gonna be in the movie where he's interviewed by this reporter. And then he lays down on his bed in the hotel and his hands go down his pants. And the scene ends with uh, Mr. Cohen, the Sasha Baron Cohen dressed in an outlandish pink costume, bursting into the room and shouting that the woman played by the actor Maria Bakalova was 15 years old. She's actually 24, but the joke is that she was 15. And there you're seeing an unfortunate image. Now, Rudy does want to try to explain this. So let's be fair, Ben. Let's hear a little bit of Rudy on 77 WABC yesterday trying to explain how that image came about. I mean, they'll do anything. They've attacked me over everything possible, investigated every business dealing I ever had. And now uh, the idiot Borat is uh, going after me with a totally sensationalized, false account of a ridiculous movie, I guess, that he's done. Now, let me tell you why I know this is a hit job that happens because uh, it's not an accident that it happens when I turn in all this evidence on their on their prince and darling uh, Joe Biden, who's one of the biggest crooks in the last 30 years. And since I have the courage to say that, I'm the target. Okay, so we're going to have the details on the shot later. So that one, Ben, is him saying that the only reason Sasha Baron Cohen is doing this is to protect Joe Biden. Right. Which I just, like they filmed this months ago. Like I just, I, I don't think that's why he did it. I think Sasha Baron Cohen does this stuff all the time. Yeah, no, he had the opportunity to do it, and so he just did it. And I'm sorry, even if you even if you place it in the political context that Rudy Giuliani wants us to consider it in, nobody made you reach down your pants, fam, and and lay back in the bed <laughs> like you're ready to go. So that's on you. But I, I love the way that he's able to to weasel his way out of it, but just by making it political. Yeah, yeah. No, nobody made you reach in your pants. Just general good advice, everybody. Just when you're on Zoom, just keep that in mind. Um, so here is Rudy uh, explaining the shot. There's all the sensational stuff about me in the movie. Don't know if it was added, doctored, manipulated, whatever. Let me tell you what happened. I went to an interview, seemed like a legitimate interview. I did the interview with the young woman who was new to interviewing, and I was being kind to her. At one point, uh, she explained to me uh, some problems she had. I, I actually prayed with her. And, uh, and then I had to, had to leave and I had my jacket on. I was fully clothed at all times. And I t had to take off the uh, electronic equipment. And when the electronic equipment came off, uh, some of it was in the back and my shirt got a little out, came a little out, although my clothes were entirely on. I leaned back and I tucked my shirt in. And at that point, um, at that point, they have this picture that they take, which looks doctored. But in any event, I'm tucking my shirt in. I assure you, that's all I was doing. When I get up, she says something about, do I want a massage? I realize now that this is a setup. And I call my security guy, Brian, who's right outside. I said, Brian, come in here. And then all of a sudden, crazy Sasha Baron Cohen runs in with a cape on and he's yelling and screaming all kinds of stupid stuff. I said, Brian, very calmly say, Brian, call the police. Okay, so um, that's an explanation. Um, ben, you've worn jackets and shirts. Uh, what do you think about that as an explanation? So, it, if I look at the picture again, is he is he tucking his shirt in? I, I, I I'm loath to give these people the benefit of the doubt, but I <laughs> have to look at the picture again. It is very possible he's tucking his shirt in, but it's also very possible and very highly likely he thought he was going to get some. Yeah, I don't I like. It's Sasha Baron Cohen who, you know, wants to create something funny. So I could mm -hmm. see him exaggerating this. I, I can. I'm, I'm trying to be fair, even though Rudy Giuliani has done literally nothing for decades to deserve any fairness from anybody. Exactly. But Giuliani is also a raving madman who seems <laughs> incredibly gullible. He's consistently accidentally butt dialing people and revealing <laughs> secret information <laughs> to reporters. Like this guy pranks himself. 
So it's possible that he would have fallen into this. I don't, uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Like, I've tucked in shirts quite a bit. Yeah. I don't think I've ever tucked in a shirt by laying down on a bed to do it. You stand up to tuck in a shirt. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to see the picture. There's a picture again. I, you know, one thing I wouldn't do to be sure is to lay back in that kind of position, tucking in my shirt with a beautiful young woman standing in front of me. Like that, I mean, just common sense is like have some. Yeah, no, he he's excited. Yeah, no. He's he wants some right here. He he he's trying to go all the way right here. He's excited. Know. He's wondering in that moment, like, how did I get? Oh man, this is this this is the best thing that's happened to me all day long. That's that's what's in his <laughs> mind. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, I don't. If I if I was being interviewed by a reporter, especially a female reporter, yeah. I'm not lying down on a bed ever. My hands aren't going in my pants ever. Um, Jacket on or jacket off, right. uh, either way. Um, right. And and it, if your electronic equipment was coming out, would it come out in the front rather than the back? back? I, right. I don't right. know. And, I, I, and I'm gonna be honest with you, at that stage and at that age, you don't do an interview with anybody in a in a hotel room by yourself. If your security guard is right outside the door, why isn't your security guard right inside the door? Right, just yeah. outside of the shot. So as a pro tip to anybody, just the, just just. Always assume that there's somebody around the corner with a camera. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And so, look, I I can't say for sure to what extent it is being made to look like something it's not. And so, I'm also not going to say that he was definitely trying to do something. I'm going right. to give him one third of a tubin, I guess, <laughs> like and reserve judgment <laughs> for the full release of the video. But I I want to add one or two other. A uh, little detail. So, and and it was in the audio that you just heard. So here's the thing: I'm always suspicious when someone has to explain something and they offer multiple explanations. Mm. Usually, there's a one good explanation. So mm. he gave an explanation for why he had to tuck in his shirt. Okay. He also said it's doctored, it's added, it's been manipulated. So wait, which is it? You're saying you tucked in your shirt, but you're also implying that what we saw didn't happen. Which of those two is it? And that makes me just question whether you can trust him at all. I don't know, the stakes are low, it doesn't really matter. Right. But I'm definitely more excited to see the video, the, the movie now. Yeah, yeah, and 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 to be fair, like I I like uh, 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 Borat <laughs> uh, Cohen. I like his work, but but sometimes his work is like it is a stretch. It is you know <laughs> the the they absolutely promote it harder than what it actually turns out to be. Um, and some of the stuff I've seen from him, it's funny, but it's like okay, this was this was a stretch. Yeah. So I, that's the only benefit of the doubt that I would give him. But but if this was what Rudy Giuliani looks like, it is. I my condolences to whoever. Um, Whoever he's done this with before, because can you just oh, look at yeah. that picture and that's just that's like the has to be the most horrific things that anybody have to walk into and um <laughs> and experience. Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't want that. Yeah, you don't want I, that. And his his daughter, I don't know if you saw, his daughter had some op ed or something about how yes. she's not that sort of Giuliani. Like she yeah. already had a tough time, and then this came <laughs> and out. And now this, and now totally. this. Wow. Yeah, I, I like Sasha Baron Cohen stuff. Um, I would say if somebody hasn't seen you, you might remember he gave a speech like a year or two ago. I think it was mainly about misinformation online and about yes. tech platforms. And it was awesome. I didn't necessarily agree with every single thing he said, but it was really good. I would don't leave and go listen to it now, but at some point you should definitely listen to that. Like, yes, he is a madman, he's wacky, but he's not an idiot. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's roll uh, right on into our next topic. I don't know for sure if we have B-roll. There we go. Sorry, that's my bad, not, not the director's. Uh, tonight is the last debate in the presidential election. The first didn't go very well for Trump. The second one didn't happen because of Trump. So now we've got this. And the question is, what is he going to do? What is he going to focus on? Now, he has a lot of people in his orbit who are orbit who are advice. Yesterday, we showed a video on the show of Mike Huckabee telling him, forget all this Hunter Biden stuff. Just talk about the economy, talk about the pandemic, talk about things that actually matter to people. Um, which is all well and good for Mike Huckabee. But this morning on Fox and Friends, Brian Kilmeade at least raised the possibility that the format of the debate, which 
is focusing on those important issues aren't necessarily gonna constrain him. Take a look. Climate change, COVID-19, American families, race, leadership, national security. How does the president, how does the president get in what he was upset about with the Biden family and with Hunter's laptop? Does he fit that in, John Rich? I'm guessing he will. Okay, <laughs> I'm guessing he will as well. So Ben, what do you think about this? What do you think Trump's strategy is gonna be? Has he learned anything from the past couple of weeks or is this gonna be something like the first debate again? I think with the exception of them having control of the microphones this time, I think it's gonna be exactly like the first debate because this is all Donald Trump knows how to do. He he cannot talk about substantive policy issues. That is not his forte. His forte is bullying a conversation and giving his supporters enough red meat for them to get up and go to the polls no matter what. That's what he does. And so I fully expect for him to try to bring up the, the ridiculousness like Hunter Biden. But but the fact of the matter is, is like we said, like you said earlier in this episode, that has already backfired spectacularly. So he doesn't really have a route to victory through tonight's debate, especially because they're gonna be muting his microphone. But I'm looking forward to see him score. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of people in our audience yesterday were wondering, um, it's all well and good for them to mute his mic, but are they gonna keep a camera on him? Is he mm-hmm. gonna be trying to talk and failing? Um, I, I I had two possible solutions for him. One is um, his mic isn't gonna be on, but Biden's is. So he might just scream loud enough to be heard on Joe Biden's mic. Oh. Some people in the chat yesterday thought he might walk over to Biden's podium <laughs> like he did kind of with Hillary Clinton. Um, all of this is sort of speculation based on our gut feelings about him. Uh, do you think it's more likely that he will just sort of you know, grin and bear it and go crazy once it's his time to talk? No, I absolutely think he's gonna try to talk even though the microphone will be cut off. So uh, that's, I am so like, please Donald Trump, just for the sake of, of of me and nobody else, please try to talk while the microphone is off. And I hope the camera does stay on him because it is going to show just how ridiculous he is. And it's gonna make him look like a, a toddler. And my apologies to toddlers across, across the <laughs> globe because Donald Trump is going to look like a complete abject moron. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, like I'm maybe I'm speaking for you. I think that we both think it would be better for him to fo- like pretend he cares about the pandemic, pretend he cares right. about the economy. Um, he's probably not going to do that. It's he's incapable. Thing- he's incapable of doing that. It's just he, he has a natural. He just can't. He has to be the complete moron that he is. So he's going to avoid mm-hmm. the things that could actually help him, and he's going to engage in the things that are actually going to help or hurt him because America's actually finally fed up with him. Yeah, yeah. I just, I wonder though. Like my my like thing, I guess is I I don't want him to win, but I feel like I should at least say what I think would help him as part of being a, a you know a political analyst or whatever. But I wonder though, would it matter? Like let let's say he says you know the pandemic's horrible and we're gonna redouble our efforts to do something about it. And you know what? We're gonna push through aid for the American people. Mitch McConnell's been holding it up for long enough, but I'm gonna make sure that people get what they need. Is it, is it too late at this point for him to pretend to care? That's a good question. That, that, that's a tough one in that um, it would be such a refreshing surprise that I think it would really capture the attention of a lot of people. CNN mm-hmm. will be ready to, to declare him presidential, all right? There'll be a Van new Jones. Tone. Right, a new Van Jones will put out a piece of new tone tonight. The president was finally president four years in. Um, I think it, I think it would have an impact, but it, I don't think it's going to move the dial on anyone's opinions. Yeah, and um, you know, if you if you had the ear of Biden or his debate prep team, what, what advice would you give to Biden for tonight? You know, I would. That's a tough one because my inclination is to fight. Right is to is to eviscerate Trump in every way imaginable, go toe to toe with them. Um, but the last debate showed that it kind of played to his advantage to be the mild manner guy, to be the guy who was Mr. Rogers as they try to insult him with. Americans are tired, <laughs> yeah, right? They they actually try to insult him by calling him Mr. Rogers when Americans are so fatigued with what's going on around us that they actually would probably prefer to see him not do what I would do, which is to just go head to head with Donald Trump and just let yeah. it all. <laughs> <laughs> find his way out. Yeah, like I got to I have to bear in mind that as as you as you mentioned, the the muting is only for those like the first 4 minutes of like a 15 minute block. There's going to be lots of time for back and forth. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of wondering if 
Like Trump wants to just lay into him, shred him, talk about crazy stuff, talk about QAnon and babies and cuties and all that stuff. Like that's what he wants. But that doesn't mean that that's what's good for him. Um, I think a lot of people felt bad for Biden and felt like the fact that Trump kept cutting in didn't give Biden the room to be flustered and make mistakes and have problems remembering things. If, if hypothetically that's a thing that could happen. And that's what Trump wants you to believe. He didn't really create an environment where that could happen because he was just hounding Biden the whole time. That will be a little bit harder to do this time. Biden will be a little bit freed up. I wonder if that's actually a good thing for Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> the, subtext of, the subtext of what you're saying is, is actually fascinating. Well, and I, let and me I, be clear. Well, really, really <laughs> let me be clear. I don't think that Joe Biden's brains are tapioca pudding like Trump says. I'm saying from Trump's team's point of view, oh. um, they think that Biden can barely keep his head off his chest. So I am, yeah, you know, I, I have no comment on that, John, because I'm going to get in trouble if I do. Uh, I actually like your first scenario where Donald Trump dominates it and doesn't give him an opportunity to have any gaffes. I think that worked in the first debate. Maybe that'll work tonight. Yeah, I I don't want to. Well, you you don't vote for me then to a town hall <laughs> participant. I don't want any more caps yeah. like that. I'm yeah. good. I'm yeah. good. Everybody's been waiting to find out what Joe Biden's position on Supreme Court reform is. And when I say everybody, I mean the media. I don't think that most people were like we're we're interested. We want the court to be expanded theoretically. I don't think a lot of voters were waiting. But um, he said he was going to let us know at some point. And in fact, he has started to do that. Um, here he is on 60 Minutes talking about what his plan is if he wins the election. If elected, what I will do is I'll put together a national commission of bipartisan commission of scholars, constitutional scholars, Democrats, Republicans, liberal, conservative. And I will uh, ask them to over uh, 180 days come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system because it's getting out of whack, um, the way in which it's ha being handled. And it's not about court packing. There's a number of other things that our constitutional scholars have debated, and I'd look to see what recommendations that commission might make. So you're telling us you're going to study this issue about whether to pack the court? No, whether there's a number of alternatives that are go well beyond packing. This is a live ball. Oh, it is a live ball. No, it is a live ball. We're going to have to do that. And you're going to find there's a lot of conservative constitutional scholars who are saying it as well. The last thing we need to do is turn the Supreme Court into just a political football. Whoever has the most votes gets whatever they want. Presidents come and go. Supreme Court justices stay for generations. <laughs> okay, so um, I have thoughts, Ben. Uh, what did you think about that? Uh, you know, I, I actually like I like what he's doing here because there are you know you you have to discuss the manner in which Republicans have been able to block every single appointment from Barack Obama, not just to the Supreme Court, but across the judiciary, and held up all of that for years. And then now Donald Trump gets an overabundance. So so it is because of the behavior of the Republican Party being obstructionist when it when it's a Democrat, and then giving everything to the Republican. Republican, that breaks the system, right? And that is going to force people to really consider packing the courts in a very significant fashion. So in terms of his commission, I think there are things that they can discuss that go far beyond. They can discuss procedural issues that would give more balance to the process in selecting these justices in the first place. But that said, pack the courts 2020. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, yeah, and I would say, like he says, well, you know, we can't have this thing where just whoever gets the most votes gets whatever they want from the Supreme Court. Okay, I get that. But like, how about we get to the point where the person who gets the most votes and indeed becomes president actually gets the justices they're supposed to get? Right. We don't even have that now. And and I'm not just talking about in the past. Obviously, we know what they did to Mayor Garland. We know what a number of senators, especially Ted Cruz, were going to do if Hillary Clinton won the election. He said. It's perfectly fine to have eight justices. There's precedent for that. Thank you, Ted Cruz. Apparently, there is precedent for other numbers other than nine. Doesn't have to go down. Maybe it goes up. Maybe we'll see. Um, but uh, let, let, I mean, even in the future, like Chris Hayes had a tweet that I found interesting, and I think it's a pretty good point. So here's a question I've been mulling. If GOP retains the Senate and Biden wins, why would McConnell ever give a hearing or vote to a single Biden judicial nominee? Right. I think that's a pretty good question. Now I know right. many people in the media, even regular people might say, well, wouldn't he have to? 
What, what would make him? Why would he have to do anything? He doesn't have to do anything. He can do whatever he wants. He can just Merrick Garland for the next four years if he wants to. It's, see, I think the underlying thing also with that question is, is how do we rectify a party that plays power politics to the extent that they will break the system, right? The Republicans have shown that they are willing to absolutely break the system to get their way. And in democracy, we're, we're struggling right now because of that. And so if they, when they talk about rectifying this, it, I think they're really, they really have to discuss the procedures in the Senate that gives them the ability to be obstructionist in no matter what position that they're in. Because our system is built on civility. Our system is based, built on norms and institutions and quote unquote gentlemanly agreements. And once you get a party who just says, "Oh, to hell with all that, we're gonna do what we wanna do, the system mm -hmm. breaks. Yeah, and the system is broken, like it, it is right now. Um, it, and, it, and we focus on Merrick Garland, but they stole so many judicial positions yes. from Barack Obama, and they will definitely do that again. Mitch McConnell is almost certainly still gonna be in the Senate. The only question is whether he's majority or minority leader, Mitch McConnell. It is favored right now that the Democrats win, but it is not a foregone conclusion. Um, God, I hope so, um, but I would say I like, the politics of what Biden said, although as a person who wants radical reform of the Supreme Court, I didn't love the implication that he's not necessarily down for expanding the court. I personally think, and maybe this makes me a bad guy, I have two things that I'm perfectly fine with happening. After all of what's happened, expanding the court I think would be fine. It's totally constitutional, they could totally do it. Alternatively, they could do something like Ro Khanna's bill to reform the Supreme Court. Instituting 18 year terms with each president uh, presidential term getting two for gradual rotation of Supreme Court justices. Um, now I know that the right wouldn't like that, in which case you come to them and say, we're doing something like this. And if not, then we've got 17 justices on the Supreme Court. That's just what's <laughs> going to happen. Absolutely. Um, and I think that they have to because Again, the system's already been broken. The authoritarians have already seized so much power and some of the power can be taken back on November 3rd, but a lot of it is now locked in for decades at this point. And so that's why we have to do something. Yeah, no, and, and, and one last thing is like, it, it has to be a not only a one, two punch, but it has to be a multi hit combination of things to make sure that we are able to bring balance. Cuz just, just doing one or two reforms can easily be undone in like four years when if we lose the Senate in the next, uh, in, in 2024, right? So they have to be willing to come in and actually stick it to this broken system that came to us by virtue of the Republican Party and institute reforms that take generations to undo the same way Republicans have come in and been obstructionists and gotten what they want that otherwise it would take us generations to undo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, oh God, just it makes me so sick that Amy Coney Barrett is, is almost certainly going to be on the Supreme Court. I know that the Dems are doing their like press conference like probably right now as we're filming this. Um, just so frustrated, I don't even want to cover it. Like after Diane Feinstein and everything that she said and yeah. hugging Lindsey Graham, thank you, thank you for such a great process. Like I've never had a process like this. What are you talking about? This is sick, you're being murdered and you're thanking the guy with his hands around your throat um, <laughs> politically. Um, yeah, I don't, don't give me your, your, your press conference. And I understand it's not just Diane Feinstein and supposedly Schumer gave her a talking to. That's not how we message about the Supreme Court. But the damage right. is already done. The damage is already done, and the damage is going to be done by literally decades. Mm -hmm. Ugh, okay. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's turn now to our next topic. It is it's a dark one, um, but important. It needs to be talked about. And so far, I have not seen this really being picked up by uh, U.S. News all that much, which seems weird to me. Okay. <clears throat> More of the terrible practices of ICE have come to light recently. Take a look at this. US immigration official officials allegedly tortured Cameroonian asylum seekers to force them to sign their own deportation orders in what lawyers and activists describe as a brutal scramble to fly African migrants out of the country in the run up to the election. So we have details on what this actually looked like in practice. Many of the Cameroonian migrants in a Mississippi detention center refused to sign, fearing death at the hands of Cameroonian government forces responsible for widespread civilian killings and because they had asylum hearings pending. So that is a great two shot of reasons to not want to be deported. You fear you might die if you are, and there's a chance that you could stay in if you have the hearing that you're supposed to have. Thus the scramble to get them out. 
According to multiple accounts, detainees were threatened, choked, beaten, pepper sprayed, and threatened with more violence to make them sign. Several were put in handcuffs by ICE officers and their fingerprints were taken forcibly in place of a signature on documents called stipulated orders of removal. By which the asylum seekers waive their rights to further immigration hearings and accept deportation. A complaint filed by FFI and the Southern Poverty Law Center cites eight cases of forced signatures or fingerprints on stipulated orders of removal. One of those involved, identified by the initials BJ, said that on the 27th of September, ICE officers pepper sprayed me in the eyes and one officer strangled me almost to the point of death. I kept telling him I can't breathe, I almost died. As a result of the physical violence, they were able to forcibly obtain my fingerprint on the document. This is this is right up there with the sickest things that we found out. And almost always, the truly sickest um, things that the Trump administration have done has been routed through ICE. It's just horrendous. John, this these stories really do something to me and on, on a on a couple of different levels. Number one, the group of people who are pedantic around whether or not it we should call these people fascists, right? What what we always find out after the fact is that what we knew was going on was just the surface of what's going on. We're going to find out later on that these atrocities go even further than this. Because I know if, if you know anything about human nature, anyone who knows about human nature, there is a very dark, sick, twisted side to people who have the ability to do these types of things. And so if this is where they are, this is what's being reported. Think about what's not being reported. And we spend so much time arguing with with folks over like, or is this the technical definition of fascism? And at the end of the day, we now have children who have been separated from, from their parents who can't find their parents. You've had forced hysterectomies, you've had these forced uh, signatures, people being tortured, being forced to sign these documents. And we have accounts of sexual abuse that's going on. If you have those things going on, we can't afford until they meet your technical definition of fascism to act on the atrocities that are happening. 100%, yeah, and and along the way, we're made to seem like the crazy radicals for wanting to abolish this organization. Exactly. Like AOC, isn't she crazy that she, she years ago was warning us about an organization that performs the hysterectomies that you know, has uh, ruined these families. Hundreds of families are never going to be reunited. And uh, oh, what do you know? We're torturing people to uh, force them to agree to be sent back to a place where some of them will probably be killed by their own government. Uh, but we're the crazies, we're the extremists because we want this organization to be uh, destroyed. Um, let me give you a little bit more information from this great reporting by The Guardian. Um, another detainee known as DF said that he was ordered to sign his deportation order by an ICE agent on the 28th of September. Quote, I refused to sign, he pressed my neck into the floor. I said, please, I can't breathe, I lost my blood circulation. Then they took me inside with my hands at my back where there were no cameras. According to his account, he was then taken to a punitive wing of the Adams County Center known as Zulu and subjected to further assault. Quote, they put me on my knees when they, where they were torturing me and they said they were going to kill me. They took my arm and twisted it. They were putting their feet on my neck. While in Zulu, they did get my fingerprint on my deportation document and took my picture. DF was one of the detainees on the October 13th flight to Douala. It is unclear what has happened to him since. That is a plane, a reference to a plane carrying 60 Cameroonian and 28 Congolese asylum seekers that was flown out. So what it appears is happening is um, ICE doesn't necessarily know if Trump is going to win. And so they wanna get in as much cruelty, as much uh, inhumane torture, and certainly as many deportations as possible before the election. Because they don't know what the future of ICE is gonna look like. And honestly, like one of the saddest outgrowths of the story is, I don't necessarily know why they're so worried. Because <laughs> I haven't heard from Biden that he's getting rid of ICE. Maybe there's <laughs> gonna be some reforms, maybe. Maybe a little bit. Maybe they could start by tracking down these individuals because these weren't robots that did this. Right. There are people at that detention center in Mississippi who did every one of these things. They need to track those individuals down. Yeah, yeah. There, there is a level of sociopathy that's attached to this, 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 um, this story. These ICE um, officers and the fact that they're able to sufficiently dehumanize their uh, victims. That they can carry out this type of thing. The the thing about it is, is this is why it's so dangerous. Is it, it actively flows from the White House in terms of the dehumanization, right? These are the type of think about how they behave 
how conservatives behave in the streets with regard to Black Lives Matter and protesters and the assault that you see from police officers, the brutal beatdown that you see across the country. The the 75 year old man in New York who had his skull cracked because he got pushed down. Like that's what they do to people who they consider fellow Americans. At least enough to to try to pretend like they care about your rights. Now think about another group of people who have been sufficiently and regularly dehumanized by the President of the United States. And now you have unleashed officers to go in and treat them in an inhumane way. And so it's just a, a direct line from the White House in terms of how they treat this group of human beings and how ICE is treating them. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I think that that connection has a couple of different forms. One is that they have encouraged cruelty, definitely, yeah. and I think that um, you know some of the people who get into this line of work apparently don't have a problem with this, and uh, and you know what, they're encouraged to do it. They're told to separate families. They're told to do mm-hmm. this sort of stuff. But then maybe even more significantly, they are effectively assured implicitly that they will be protected. That there's not going to be an investigation, that they're not going to be fired, their careers aren't going to be ruined. You can do whatever it is, whatever sick thing is in your heart, is in your soul, you can do it. If you want to brutalize people to get them to sign something, if you want to sexually assault detainees, Stephen Miller isn't going to be coming to look for you. Like, do you think Bill Barr is going to be investigating? No, it's part encouragement, and then it's definitely looking the other way. Um, this is just mafia stuff at the level of a national government. And, and, and one thing that I think people, people who still want to use the pedantic kind of argument against calling this fascism, I want you to see how close it's getting to home, right? We saw this in, um, in the Iraq war. We saw this in the detainees at Guantanamo yeah. Bay. We saw it, it was offshores, right? It was done like by the CIA at black sites offshores. It's gotten close, it's, it's, it's happening in our borders. In, it's happening in Mississippi. In Georgia, right? And it's right now it's happening to um, immigrants, but it's getting one step closer to happening to average citizens. If you look at how the federal agents responded to Kenosha, Wisconsin, and Portland, you see how they, you know, how Donald Trump sent federal agents to gun down Michael Reinhold. When you see how they reacted by snatching people off the streets in Portland, right? If you're waiting to really figure out if this is the precise definition of fascism that's now happening inside of our borders, I, I'm afraid you're going to wake up and realize that it's happening to you. Or maybe not you, because you're doing a you're facilitating the job of of delaying the actual conversation by all yeah. of this pedanticism. So maybe they'll be all right. Yeah, and some of the things you just mentioned, um, like Trump bragging about the fact that they just went and gunned down Michael Reinhold, and did, did they didn't want to arrest him? They just they right. just wanted to kill him, so they did. They just killed him, and him like encouraging people, you know, to further vilify uh, Gretchen Whitmer. Like yeah. it's all it's all open. It, these are applause lines at rallies. This isn't like Oh, Mother Jones got a source that said, you know, off the off the record, uh, Trump said it somewhere in a back room. This is him screaming it into video cameras to make himself more popular, more loved um, by his base. This is all stuff that has happened and has flourished inside of his first term, where he at least has to sort of pretend to care about getting reelected. <laughs> if if they make it through, if he wins this election, they will interpret that as a you know stamp of approval from the American people, and I would argue that's what it is. Yeah. If Trump wins, it is because the American people honestly aren't against this stuff. Right. Some of them are still ignorant, but there has been enough critical coverage over the past few years that enough people should know better. We have shed light on what's being done. Now the question is, is this the country we want to be? And I'm sort of asking that as a spur to action, but I'm also just curious. I'm really curious if we're gonna be Germany, honestly. Like, is that who we're gonna be? And I worry, it is still a tight thing. Biden's up in the polls, it's looking pretty good, but he could still definitely lose despite everything that we know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it is not only the question of is this the kind of America we actually are, but it's also a question of how many people, even if they don't actively vote for Donald Trump, how many people 
can turn a blind eye to it and just decide, hey, it's not that serious. I'm not that afraid of it. Well, yeah, maybe you're not afraid of it because it hasn't hit your street. But for a lot of people, it has already hit their streets. It's already hit their families. 220,000 people dead, 545 children who have been separated from their parents. That is a level of grieving across this country like we have never seen before. And and I think for you to just casually just dismiss our responsibility to get this evil out of office, even if you don't vote for him, it, it's a tacit endorsement of what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I, I'm glad that you mentioned that the pandemic dead because, like, it's you know um, the American people being okay with immigrants being you know tortured and sexually assaulted and all of that. Okay, we're we're a terrible people. I'm not all that shocked by a lot of <laughs> Americans being okay with that. Honestly, um, a lot of white Americans ignoring um, police brutality. Yeah. Against black and brown bodies, uh, not that shocked by it because we're a very racist nation, honestly. Um, he's also letting t- t- tens of thousands of people die. Like this is like this is like people supporting Hitler with Hitler going door to door shooting the good Germans. Like, yeah. what does it take to wake you up? They're not even just doing the racist, xenophobic stuff. They're killing you too. Tucker Carlson is telling his audience to die. And they don't mind. What a year! <laughs> what a year! They're they're like they've got their hands around the throats of their base, and their base is like two thumbs upping them. <laughs> don't and get it. Just and don't get their it. their base their base loves to call us sheep, um, but honestly, they're the ones who are regularly being led to the slaughter. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, what a year! What a year! We've got just like 12 days until the election. So let's take a look at the financial status of these two campaigns. See what we can learn about their ability to really shake things up with the days that remain. So President Trump's reelection campaign committee, apparently, according to the reporting, ended September with only $63.1 million in the bank. Despite canceling some television buys late last month that we reported on, leaving him badly outmatched financially against Joe Biden, who reported $177.3 million in cash on hand for the final stretch of the campaign. Fortunes have reversed sharply from this spring when Trump and the Republicans had nearly 190 million more in the bank than Biden and the Democrats at that point. Now, entering October, Mr. Biden had close to triple as much of the most flexible campaign dollars as the president, which I guess isn't super surprising. The Democrats do always raise a lot during presidential elections. But remember that Joe Biden was the guy who wasn't doing a great job during the primary of raising money. Like he was being regularly beaten by not just like Bernie and Warren, but Buttigieg as well. The last few months, that has not been the case. And they now have a huge amount of money with which to run ads, be flexible, all of that stuff, Ben. Yeah, yeah. I hope that they um, they've been spending in some key key areas. Like ads, ads are effective to a certain extent, but I, I'm I'm a little concerned about their ground game in some of the key states. Um, so, I, and I don't know that they have enough time to actually get. A ground game in some of these areas. So uh, they have a lot of money, but it's about how they have been using it up to this point. And at at this point, it's just like last minute spending. You know, you you just reminded me of something that there had been some reporting on, uh, but I haven't seen anything in like a month. Yeah, that that lack of you know get out the vote door to door. Oh God, now I'm a little bit scared. That that's true. <laughs> like Florida, yeah. they supposedly did not have much of a presence. Right. Um, even states like Michigan. Yeah. Oh God. Anyway, well, they've got money. Maybe do something. Maybe yeah. not just ads. And also maybe ads in places like Texas. Just try. Come on. Texas deserves it. It deserves to go blue. Spend a little bit of money. You've got it. Um, but anyway, uh, really fast. Let's run through a few other bits of news about the financial status. I just wanted to. I love that our producers threw this in the document, this old tweet from Brad Parscale, who has troubles of his own. For nearly three years, we've been building a juggernaut campaign. Death Star. It is firing in all cylinders, data, digital, TV, political, surrogates, coalitions, debt. So much debt, we don't have any money. No, um, in a few days we start pressing fire for the first time. <laughs> well, he got fired um, and now apparently they're running out of money. So here's the thing, it is one thing for him to be lagging um, in money, okay? Here's the thing, Trump is supposedly a billionaire. He's lagging by like a hundred million dollars. He could give himself a hundred million dollars and supposedly not even care about it. He'll just endorse a couple more products and he'll be fine. Here's the thing. He's apparently not actually doing that. 
Back in early September, he weighed spending as much as $100 million of his own money on his reelection bid. When asked by reporters if he planned to sell fun part of his run, Trump said, if I have to, I would. Well, apparently you have to, but the money hasn't actually materialized. Trump has contributed just over $8,000 to his campaign so far this cycle. Back in 2016, he contributed 66 million. So if if I'm trying to read his like expectation of a win, how invested he is in a thing, I'm gonna mm-hmm. do that based on his investment. And he's invested eight grand. That's nothing. I don't even know <laughs> how did he invest so little? What did he get? Yeah. Like, did he get a straw or something? A hat? <laughs> I don't not a mask, I know that. <laughs> No, it's, I think that's the perfect analysis, right? Um, he he poured in that initial money in 2016. He he saw he was onto something. He had an opportunity, and now I think he sees clearly. Like I'm not putting my money out there. First of all, I don't think he has the same amount of money, right? I don't think he has the money that he's been bragging about. Uh, and and now that we all know that he's in debt, uh, maybe that's like his kryptonite, you know, sunlight. Everyone knows that you're actually not this rich. So he's like, okay, I'm only, only going to spend eight thousand dollars. Besides, he's got four hundred million dollars worth of debt that he has to take care of uh, coming up soon. Some some of those key yeah. things that he owes has to be paid coming up soon. That's true. That's true. You might want to save a little bit of money for that. Um, and so uh, for those watching, why, why does this matter? Well. Remember, we've we've got less than two weeks. The polls have been fairly consistent now for weeks. They could be consistently wrong. That is a possibility that I am not discounting, but they've been pretty consistent. And so what we're doing is we we're reading the tea leaves. We've got our fingers in the sheep entrails. We're just trying to see what could shake this up. That's why we we care about this debate. Although it doesn't feel at this point like it's likely to really shake things up. Uh, ad buys and further campaigning that is funded by these millions of dollars could do that, but that's just that's not what we're seeing. Like they're they're pulling spending from states that they're, they're putting spending in the states they expected to win comfortably, like Ohio and Iowa, and others that they thought might be competitive. They're just pulling entirely out of, and it's not to say that he couldn't still win these states. Like he could, but this is these are not signs of strength um, in the final stretch of a campaign, basically. He's on his last legs, and 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 I'm I'm hoping all things remaining equal that that he will experience a loss that is going to send him running out of the country. Like he said, if he loses, he's going to have to leave. Mm. Uh, so he's maybe saving his money for that. Yeah, maybe maybe he wants to go <laughs> get first uh, first class. One other just fun bit of information on the the funding that I thought was interesting. So lawyers at Jones Day, uh, so this is a, a legal firm that has earned millions as outside counsel for Donald Trump. Have donated nearly ninety thousand dollars to the campaign committee of Joe Biden. Uh, contributions to the Trump campaign by those same lawyers has totaled fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so they've earned four point five million dollars since 2019 working for the Trump campaign, and they have plowed some of that money back into replacing Donald Trump in this election. I just thought that that was. No, that's, that's funny. A, that's amazing. That <laughs> that is $50. Donald Trump is funding his own opposition with all of his outside representation. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Fifty dollars is nothing. That's like Trump's federal tax burden, basically. <laughs> like that's how low that is. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. And again, please, everybody, don't get complacent. You hopefully should have already voted, but if not, please register. Um, you know what? Let, let's do the game that we do uh, quite often uh, in the chat right now. Whether you're on Twitch or on YouTube, if you voted, right, voted. If you're registered but haven't voted yet, right, registered. And if you haven't done either, get out of here. Come on, seriously, <laughs> what are you doing at this point? Get out of the chat. I'm kidding, but maybe you're international. Um, I'm seeing a lot of voted come in. Yeah, one or two registered. It's a lot more voted than it was the first time we did this a few weeks back. Bad Rongo says registered. Don't hate me. I don't hate you. I accept you for who you are. Okay, a lot of voted there. Okay, okay, maybe maybe we can be confident. People don't seem like they're taking anything for granted. Um, but anyway, I, I know Ben, you're going to be involved in our election coverage, yeah. and uh, we're probably going to be talking to you for the rest of election week because there's a good chance it's not going to be wrapped up on that first day. Right. Anyway, thank you for joining us on this show um, and giving us your, your perspective in that that final stretch. We really appreciate oh, it. Always a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Shout out to the Dragon Squad. Thank you. Uh, where can people watch your show? Uh, right here on YouTube, the Benjamin Dixon Show, right on YouTube. 
Awesome, everybody should definitely do that. Thank you, Ben, really appreciate it. Have a good one. Take care, you too. The Senate Democrats are holding a press conference talking about Amy Coney Barrett and their issues with the nomination process for this most recent likely entrant to the Supreme Court. They're doing that, but it is looking like she is probably going to end up on the court. And that is important for a lot of reasons that we've talked about on the show for several weeks now. But I wanna focus in on one of perhaps the most important, and that is what Amy Coney Barrett's presence on the Supreme Court means for Americans' reproductive freedoms going forward. Forward. And joining us now to break this down, lay out the stakes and tell us how things might develop over time is Mary Ziegler, law professor at Florida State and author of Abortion and the Law in America. Mary, welcome to the Damage Report. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much. You're seeing um, the, uh, the book uh, cover right there. So um, one of the often mentioned fears around Amy Coney Barrett, what, what impact she could have on the Supreme Court is that it could mean that Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. Um, I'm not a legal scholar, that's why we're bringing you on. Do you think that that's effectively going to happen? We're just wondering when, how inevitable do you consider that? It, there's nothing inevitable when you're talking about the Supreme Court. These people are are there for a lifetime, at least until something changes, which means that there can always be surprises. Um, but it would be a pretty big surprise indeed if the Supreme Court didn't overturn Roe, because you have to remember, right? There's already a five justice conservative majority that's been put there with an eye to overturning Roe. And now there's an insurance policy in the form of Amy Coney Barrett. So for example, even if Chief Justice Roberts or one of the court's conservatives got cold feet about overturning Roe, it wouldn't matter anymore because there would still be five votes to overturn Roe. So I think mm -hmm. we're we're more looking at a question of, of when, not if. And um, you know, during the the Senate hearings that went on, um, she attempted to portray herself as many of those trying to get on the Supreme Court do as a person who has no preferences, no thoughts, no ideology, nothing. It's just mm -hmm. a case will come and I will take a look at it. I will read many dusty books and then I will decide. Um, based on what you have seen about Amy Coney Barrett and her history, do you think that that's an accurate reflection of what she'll be like on the Supreme Court? I mean, that's not really an accurate reflection of what anyone is like on the Supreme Court, but I mean, certainly, it's not an accident that President Trump promised to pick someone who would overturn Roe and then picked Amy Coney Barrett. He did that because she's that person. Um, we know a little bit about her record. She hasn't been um, a judge for very long, but as a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, she pretty much would have voted to uphold every abortion restriction that came before her. And in doing that seemed pretty willing to either ignore or um, effectively rewrite judicial precedent to get the result she wanted, which obviously doesn't bode well for uh, Roe and the cases that follow it, which of course are precedent too. Um, Amy mm -hmm. Coney Barrett in her private life is pro-life. Now that doesn't mean she'll necessarily vote that way, but I think President Trump and his allies expect her to, which is why her nomination has been so energizing on the right. Now, um, obviously, we're, we're talking about her. We're talking about the Supreme Court, um, but but a lot of abortion law is, uh, you know, it's made at the state level. Um, so, right. to what extent is the? I, I don't want to just launch into this conversation without it first questioning the Supreme Court's obviously important. How, what what percentage of this conversation is the Supreme Court? If you're uh, if you're a woman who's worried about what the future might bring in this area, how important is her presence on the Supreme Court for that? It's really important because the way to think about it is that at the moment there's a federal constitutional abortion right which sort of sets the floor. So states can do whatever they want as long as they don't fall below that floor. Um, Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court likely means that that floor is gone, right? Which would open the door to states passing outright bans on abortion, which they've already signaled that they're interested in doing. And the only reason those laws are not in effect right now is because the federal courts have, have blocked them citing Roe. Um, so a lot of the action is in the states, and it's worth saying that if, if Roe is gone, then what abortion access looks like for women, and maybe contraceptive access too, we can talk a little bit about that, um, will depend on state Supreme Courts and state legislatures. But there won't be that kind of safety net anymore that there is now in the form of a federal constitutional abortion, right? 
And um, you know whether it's uh, legislation that would be passed to outright ban abortion in the wake of Roe v. Wade being overturned, or I, you know I've read about legislation that is effectively in a holding pattern until it's um, overturned. Do we have any idea of how many states would very significantly curtail these freedoms, if not outright ban them? We know it's at least a minimum of 21. Um, there are 21 states that have laws already that would essentially ban most or all abortions if Roe is overturned. A lot of those are called trigger laws, right? The idea being that if, if Roe is gone, the trigger is pulled and the law automatically goes into effect. Um, it's not clear that that'll be where it stops, right? There will there may well be more than 21 states. Um, you can kind of roughly think of putting states in three categories. You'd have very blue progressive states that would probably expand access to abortion. You'd have conservative red states that would ban probably all or most abortions, including in cases of rape or incest. And then you'd have states like Florida, where I am, that would become as they always are kind of battlegrounds where the outcome would be hard to predict ahead of time. And um, you know, I, I've seen polls. Um, it seems consistently that you know most Americans support you know maintaining at least the current level of access to these sorts of services. Um, the, the polls during the Amy Coney Barrett hearing seem to confirm that. So I, I know that you're not here mainly to talk about the political implications of this, but but it seems like an odd move to to outlaw mm -hmm. something that people, the majority of people, support in so many states simultaneously. I wonder has that been a part of the conversation as these laws have been passed about the possible electoral ramifications of it? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is that there's lots of historical evidence that people in the GOP love the idea of using Roe to raise money and to rally the base, but they haven't historically really loved the reality of Roe being overturned in part because it isn't popular and also in part because then there's no whipping boy, right? You can't use mm -hmm. Roe to fundraise or rally the base anymore. Um, it's not the same calculus at the state level because what may be disastrous politics nationally might be quite successful in Mississippi or Alabama or a place like that where you have fairly strong majorities of voters opposed to most abortion. But I think even there you're dealing with some potential political fallout. After all, Mississippi in 2011 had an option to pass a personhood law, right? That would have banned abortions and potentially also banned in vitro fertilization and contraception and voters rejected it. Now that was obviously Obviously not because voters support abortion rights, but it was because when the rubber met the road and they had to think about what an abortion ban could mean in practice, a lot of conservative voters blinked. And so I think it'll be a challenge in even the most conservative states um, for lawmakers to kind of flesh out what it's going to mean to ban abortion. So, for example, mm -hmm. you know, are women going to be punished, or um, do you include things like IUDs, which many uh, pro-life or anti-abortion folks believe are abortifacients? Like those are going to be really challenging to answer questions, even in states where it's been very good politics up until now to go after Roe. Yeah, yeah, and and when the rubber hits the road, um, the doctors being you know hauled into prison or the women being jailed, um, that that's probably going to be quite difficult. It, it's very easy for Trump in an offhand comment with Chris Matthews to say that women should be punished, but what exactly is that punishment? Is it a fine? Is it prison terms? Do we want to be a country that that does that? Um, but but anyway, you, you've sort of I think implied in this area. You, you have a recent op-ed um, in the Washington Post. Uh, that talks about not just the fact that they might ban abortion, but that they might go further. What what are some um, ways that they could go further than than that? Well, the thing I think that's important to recognize, right, is that we don't all agree on what abortion means. So Amy Coney Barrett during her hearings was very clear. You know, she said there's the, there's no way anyone is going after birth control. She actually that was one of the few things she was very clear about, and that's true. But the problem is not everybody agrees on what birth control is, right? So um, abortion opponents often argue, as I mentioned, that life begins at fertilization. And then they argue that certain common forms of contraception like um, emergency contraception like Plan B and Ella and IUDs um, act to basically block implantation rather than fertilization. Now there's disagreements about whether that's true as a medical matter. And there's also disagreements about when life begins, obviously. But there, the point I think is that many people who are opposed to abortion view some of those drugs as abortifacients and to know that you simply need to look at the Hobby Lobby litigation where pretty powerful 
pro-life slash anti-abortion groups were arguing that those drugs were abortifacients in challenging the contraceptive mandate of the Affordable Care Act. So there'll also have to be a conversation about what we mean when we talk about abortion and whether we include things that many of us think include are really contraceptives, not abortion. Um, in, in regards to Amy Coney Barrett, do we do we have any evidence of where exactly she might come down in that conversation? Uh, we don't, apart from her personal views. We know that as a, in her personal life, she believes that life begins at fertilization, as many um, conservative Catholics do. Uh, we don't have a sense of whether she'll write that opinion into law, um, or if she would have you know support from other conservative members of the court. But it's worth mentioning, right, that another outcome that's possibly on the table if the Supreme Court is conservative enough is a nationwide ban on abortion, right? So the effect of overturning Roe, as we've been saying, is more or less to let the states do whatever they want, right? They can ban abortion, they cannot ban abortion. Um, People who are opposed to abortion will probably eventually go to the Supreme Court and argue that there's a federal constitutional right to life. And a federal constitutional right to life would have the effect of banning all abortions. So in progressive as well as conservative states. And that's still a little bit of a long shot, but it's much more likely when you have this conservative supermajority and you have a lot of judges who've been handpicked with the goal of overturning Roe and going further in mind. I mean, look, my my knee jerk reaction to that would be that hypothetically some sort of constitutional right to life would seem to include areas other than just abortion. It seems like you can't have, you can't not have a conversation about capital punishment, police brutality, you know, any number of different topics that are often ignored when when talking about pro life people. In any event, um, it's an important conversation and, and I really appreciate you explaining how, you know, even if we have come to accept that this might mean the end of Roe, that is not necessarily the end of the conversation. And things could go in some pretty crazy directions after that. And so, Absolutely. Mary Zegler- And I think the end of, oh, sorry. I mean, the end of Roe, too, isn't even the end when it comes to abortion. Because if this is an, inter- an issue that interests you, there's going to be fights in all 50 states. There'll probably be a fight in Congress. No one will give up on the Supreme Court. I mean, Joe Biden today has announced a, a, a kind of period to study possible court reform. So if we've learned anything from the past 50 years with Roe, it's that the Supreme Court can't settle this or make it go away. So even if there's a decision overturning Roe, the conflict will continue just in different, probably unpredictable ways. Yeah, and perhaps in the future, um, we can speak again as uh, those likely court cases start working their way up to its Supreme Court that might at that point include Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, Mary Ziegler, we really, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.